First of all, Sean, tell me about growing up in Detroit. What was it like? Uh, I was very, um, very blessed to have, you know, you talk about the cultures and the way that, as a parent now, um, when you're talking about raising children, you want your kids to, to understand that they're, they're very, uh, the difference between making it and not making it is not, you know, glaring differences. It's very subtle. And I think growing up in, the, in an era in Detroit where the basketball culture was starting to really, you know, uh, peak its head. Uh, players right ahead of me were uh, Derek Coleman and Steve Smith, uh, Doug Smith, who had played at Missouri. Uh, the guys right behind me were uh, uh, Jalen Rose and, and Chris Webber uh, and Howard Isley, and those were guys, you know, I was stuck right in between them. So I had an era that I, I got a chance to see basketball, especially at the high school level. Terry Mills, uh, those were guys that started to really make a name for the city of Detroit and, and create a brand. And then the guys afterward that followed up. So it was great for me to get stuck in between, you know, uh, great classes of basketball players, yet still guys that weren't, you know, prep schools were not developed. So, you know, guys didn't leave the city and head out you know, to the suburbs uh, 30 minutes away or prep schools. I mean, you were still in the city, and you had to t figure out how how much love did you have for the game. Were you willing to walk away from things that your friends and your and your neighbors and, uh, and things that were going on in your neighborhood to still go play the game of basketball, or was it was it not enough, you know, to draw you away and, and pull you into that kind of a world? So it was great for me to learn that uh, I was willing to sacrifice whatever that was to go play the, a game that I thoroughly still enjoy being around but loved. Then, you know, you got to college, and I would have never now, were imagined. Were you highly rated coming out of college? Not at all. As I was just going to say, I, I would have never guessed my career to be what it was. I was a, we, had a, we had a great high school program. Uh, we were always perennially st or state ranked. We were always, you know, top five in the state. So my high school coach, Michael Fusco, did a tremendous job of taking a group of kids that could have easily been off somewhere else doing things that we weren't supposed to do. And he, and he opened the gym and constantly kept us in the gym and gave us structure. And we just took it and ran with it. And so you know, we developed a high school program that for about seven or eight years just constantly challenged you know, any other school in the Detroit area, uh, Bishop Borges High School. Uh, and that, that's where I kind of learned that, you know, being able to have a place to go and, and still get something done. That was the basketball gym for me. And you get to college, I, again, my assumption was I was, I was a, a solid student. Uh, I was a kid that loved to play. I'd end up being, a, you know, a decent player on a really good Michigan State basketball team at some point in my college career. Uh, I sustained a knee injury my senior year in the city championship game. Uh, tore my ACL and you know the ACL injuries back in the late 80s um, he just assumed hey, if you make it back to even 50 percent of what you were that was a miracle uh, and nine months later I was cleared to play so you know I was really adamant about trying to do everything that I could to get back to the bat and that, and that taught me a work ethic you know really how to uh, take something so serious that you were willing again to sacrifice something for it. Uh, so I didn't get I didn't have a great social life and I didn't do some of the things I know a lot of people who have opportunity to go to college that you know we talk about seeing some parties and hanging out and I never lived that life. You know, I was so focused on getting back to playing at a level that I thought I was kind of getting to right before I blew my ACL out in the uh, city championship. So to come in as a Redshirt freshman, Steve Smith is there. Same thing. I just kind of wanted to mirror some things that he had uh, set like a foundation for. Him. And as he graduated, there was this big void as who was going to take over this Michigan State program. And Judd Heathcote pretty much gave me an open palette. You know, just hey, if you can score the ball and we can do some things, it's yours. And so, I, again, just the opportunity there. I prepped for it and it, it just, you know, perfect worlds came together. And then three years later, going to my senior year, I think everybody now, you know, we all know what that year was like. You know, Eric Snow and I were uh, arguably the best backcourt in the country and watching his game develop and, I, you know, I passed up going to the NBA. Uh, 
and it just it was that was the climax of everything finally coming together of you know understanding why those years of sacrifice and and staying in school and uh, having an opportunity to really put the program at another level and it worked you know it was really like the key I think to everything that I do now just watching um, things that you you make an assumption that ah, you know, I should have done this because I you know that that opportunity passed me by but you see it you're few years later and you say, no, nah, that was that was the best thing for me, even if it you thought something else was better. And then uh, I got to get drafted. Uh, and uh, again, just another transition. You know, I was 22 years old and you expected for your pro career to, to really, you know, just continue on in the next thing. And I just remember uh, feeling a little bit uh, sensitive in my stomach area. Uh, right after All-Star break and uh, just remember kind of talking to trainers and just saying, man, something doesn't feel right. And it just kind of continued to become more and more sensitive. You know, I, first it was like pressing it, then it was like so sensitive I put cl clothes on, just a shirt, and it rubbed the spot. It would, you know, it would feel like my body was on fire. Um, and then eventually, you know, having the doctors uh, take the test, and I just remember the the call I got, and sitting in there, and the guy says, you know, can you sit down? <laughs> you know, I want to talk to you about something. And just when you hear the news, uh, you know, when you're a young guy, cancer seems like the old people's disease. You know, it's not something that at 23 years old at the time that I'm supposed to be dealing with. Um, but I just remember that was something that it changed. It changed my thought patterns. You know, I. I became um, a little more passive about things. I, I wasn't as aggressive about trying to, you know, hold on to a career. You know, just other things mm -hmm. in life became bigger. Uh, well, is this life-threatening type cancer? I, I don't know much about stomach cancer. So, well, they have different kinds. The kind I had was, a, was, was an aggressive form. Um, we we didn't know how long, you know, uh, but the assumption was I was misdiagnosed for almost two months, mm -hmm. you know, before realizing, okay, let's finally go get something checked out. So after a couple months of, you know, an aggressive cancer, um, I I started taking the highest form of radiation, and we just and and you know, back in you talking about the early mid '90s. I mean, at that point weren't sure how your body responds and how fast the medical, you know, results come. So for about maybe a month, um, I was kinda at the fifty fifty. You know, if it if it if your body's responding and we see something, then great. We we we'll, we'll be more aggressive, we'll hit it every day. But if we don't, then we gotta just kinda come back and figure out something. So it was about three weeks of you know, radiation treatments that I had to go to it, it, at the end of that season. So I was going through radiation treatments in March and then in April and just trying to still go to practice. And You didn't tell anybody on the team? The trainer knew, the the uh, coach knew. Our coach was uh, like kind of, uh, Mike Dunleavy was in the role like Popovich. He was the coach and a GM. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was one and the same. So the front office is, you know, new essentially. But as far as teammates, no. I mean, you know, I just, uh, like I said, it was maybe a little bit of shame at that point because, you know, again, I'm 20-something years old. I mean, can, you know, me having cancer, like, I, I just figured, I was naive saying, you know, I'll, I'll finish with these treatments and I'll be done and back to my career. But, you know, you realize, again, years later, you realize how lucky I am, you mm -hmm. know. It, it could have happened. At, it could have happened ten years earlier or ten years later, and it changes the dynamic, you know. But at 23 years old, to have to go through the type of treatments right, I had you, was man. the best thing that could happen because physically I was able to sustain and endure the damage that it, you know, was that it does to people, mm -hmm. and psychologically I was too naive to give up, you know, and feel right. like it's, this is something that maybe I should worry about. I didn't worry about anything. I just I, whatever I wanted to hurry and get back to playing basketball, but I didn't allow my body to heal. You know, I was trying to still play and getting injured, and it just took longer to heal. You know, when you get bumps and bruises and nicks, and eventually it just kind of, you know, it cost me a, a bit of my early career. But I'm most proud of that I got through that era, and by the time I finished my career, 
uh, toward the end. I was able to play again at a high level, you know, in Europe and finish my last couple of years where I was a league MVP over in Poland and, and in um, Italy and Greece. And just, you know, I, I felt good about the game. 